I'm George Siemens. I'm with the University of Manitoba in Manitoba, Canada. I just want to talk a little bit about a course that I was involved in this last fall that brought together some of the experiences I've had around technology since the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, my background with technology initially was very traditional in that uh, we focused on using learning management systems, uh, WebCT, uh, Blackboard, those kinds of tools in the educational process. But it was a bit of a dichotomy. I would spend a good portion of my time with students in a traditional learning management system, and yet what I found was that most of my learning that I was doing from a professional development end didn't happen that way. Uh, it happened actually in a much more uh, open, freer kind of environment. So I started looking a little bit more at what could education be like or what should education be like if we wanted to give uh, learners the opportunity to engage with material and each other the same way that I saw many people online through social media uh, engaging with each other. Now at that point, early 2000, we didn't call it social media, you know, the term blogs uh, was probably more common at that stage, but really it was the ability to talk to people around the world on your own terms in, in a manner that you were comfortable with. So the course that we did in 2008, and it was a course that was Stephen Downs, we, it was titled Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. And we had the emphasis with a course to take the view, and, and my own view is that learning is fundamentally networked. Now, when we connect to other people, when we connect ideas, that's where we gain our understanding, and uh, that's really where we gain a depth of knowledge about a subject matter. So we, we decided that we'd like to take the course and have it reflect in format what we said learning was about in, in the course itself. So the, the content of the course was about connectivism and yet the mode, the method of delivery of the course was similar. So a few things that we did that I, I think challenged the notion of a traditional learning management system and students that we've had take the course and, and I still get emails on a, on a weekly basis of learners who say you know wow this this course helped me see this or this course was you know a tremendous learning experience uh, we decided not to do a traditional structured environment we took a weekly reading list a couple of links each week uh, commentary that Stephen and I put out and we basically made it available for for students to to in, encounter explore on their own but we really emphasized that the making of coherence in a subject matter that you're new to is one about dialoguing with other learners. It's one about deciding what's important, you know, what belongs here, what doesn't. If I have two or three concepts, which one's important, which one do I apply extra weight to? Now the field of learning theory and learning science has, has a lot of history that emphasizes the greatest indicator of our ability to learn a new subject is what we already know which I guess is the big problem because most education today is set up completely disregarding that important element. We design instead a course and we put our course together and blast it out to students. We pay little recognition, at least at the design stage, to what it is that learners currently know. Our assumption with the course was that if we make conversations a priority, if we form a base of content and make it available, the ability for students to contextualize it will come through their contributions of content, their interactions around the material, and that was really what we tried to emphasize. We had a significant impact, I think, in, in terms of uh, promoting openness. We had about, uh, I think at our peak, about 2,400 students that took the course without fee, and we made it freely available, but we also uh, had the opportunity opportunity for students to enroll for credit as part of our Certificate in Emerging Technologies course at our program at University of Manitoba. The students then who participated were able to, the fee and the ones who participated without fee, uh, participated in weekly discussions, they participated in commentaries or, or discussions on Moodle, uh, which was all open. We encouraged them to use course tags, uh, which they would post on their blogs, on Delicious or whatever other sites they, they promoted. We also, Steve and I, put together a daily newsletter that uh, threw out ideas that we concepts that we thought were important, ideas that other students had expressed, because we wanted to really emphasize to learn you must connect to a network, and we tried to serve a role as temporary as, as network mediators. We gave learners the opportunity to, to uh, come to know each other in a way they might not do in a traditional course. The big emphasis was 
we are one node, as, as the, the instructors, we're one node in an overall network. A fully formed network is going to have a lot of different nodes, a lot of different representation points. So we, we tried to emphasize the importance of making personal coherence in the subject, but it doesn't mean that we didn't do anything as educators. I mean, we certainly spent time commenting on, on posts and engaging others in ideas and uh, being challenged by students and challenging other students as well. So it's not that it was this, you know, fluffy run through a meadows course. It was. I think it was rigorous intellectually uh, there, uh, from students that have commented on it was more valuable than a tradition cor uh, traditional course and because we made the conversation and the content open, uh, we had you know, one example, the course syllabus was translated into five different languages by, by participants. We didn't ask them to, they just translated it. Uh, we had a group that formed in Second Life that, that built an entire building in Second Life with a reading list from the course weekly reading list. Uh, you know, the, the innovations that came out of the course were not ones that we could have possibly conceived, but they were a byproduct of the fact that we made the course itself open. And if you look, at, le at least my view is, uh, students today at any age level, whether it's students directly out of high school into higher education, or whether it's students who are going back to uh, college or university for a second degree, they have control over content and conversations. Uh, we, we need to rethink education. That, it, that recognizes that students are in control of the information they access. Ten years ago they weren't. We could assign a textbook and they might not be able to get a good quality video or, or you know, one example I saw was uh, someone in, uh, posted a video in a masonry course in uh, Second Life on how to pour concrete. I mean, you know, t ten years ago, five years ago, pre-YouTube, you'd have a hard time getting a quality video demonstrating how to do this, so you relied on the instructor. Today, the information's available and it's free in many instances, so it's time to start asking what could education be and how do we need to do our courses differently? How do we need to foster different connections with students in a course, with experts in the field outside of who the core facilitators are? So I guess on many levels that that, that the, the course, the Connective and Connective Knowledge course was a culmination of uh, you know, about 10 years of work in the field and it was really an attempt to say how could we readjust education to reflect the current reality for students.